Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the State of the Web. My guest is Tom Steiner. He's a developer advocate at Google. And today, we're talking about the state of progressive web apps, also known as PWAs. Let's get started. Tom, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. So let's start by defining some of the key terms here. When we talk about a progressive web app, what does the progressive part mean? Like, what is the baseline from which we're progressing? Mm -hmm. So I think there's essentially two ways of defining it. So one is more the technical angle, where you come from like different APIs that are available or not on a browser. So you can think of the progressiveness like in the sense of progressive enhancement, where you test does a certain browser support a certain API that you want to use, like does it have the service worker uh, APIs. And the second take of it would be more like progressively developing from just being or just being a website to being an actual application. So um, you start with maybe navigating to a site, you start using it, and then the more you use it, the more it does feel like an application, something that you actually wanted to use more fre frequently, something that you would actually might want to install in your, on your home screen. So I think this is like more the slowly developing into being an app progressiveness. Okay, so when we, in the second part of that, the web app part, is there a distinction between that and a website? <laughs> so I think it's more, yeah, as I said, about developing from just being a website into being an uh, actual application. And um, that's also what's confusing a lot of people, like um, PWA, the A part, like, like is it an app in the sense of I go to an app store, I go to the Play Store to install it, um, or is it an app in the sense of, yeah, just as we defined before, something that slowly becomes an app by just being more useful, being more uh, app-like in its behavior. And uh, yeah, so I think this is uh, the core distinction here. Gotcha. So are PWAs more discouraging some of the old ways of making websites, or is it encouraging some of the latest and greatest APIs? It's more like, um, yeah, progressively being more useful and doing things that until before only native applications could do. So let's take um, the example of being able to work offline or under like heavy um, network situations where you don't really predictably know is the network going to be there at all, like in a subway where you sometimes have a network, sometimes you don't. Sometimes the phone says you do have network, but actually you don't because whatever, networks hate you as Alex Russell puts it. Um, so yeah, I think it's more about um, yeah, how you work under these uh, circumstances. And um, if, you, if you can then still reliably deliver an app-like experience. So I think it's more about encouraging new ways of thinking, um, like a paradigm shift already, um, that you start with having a website, but then how can you turn that into an app-like experience? How are developers progressifying their websites? What kinds of tools are they using? Um, so first I would say from a functional angle, um, you have something as simple as maybe uh, adding push notifications to maybe improve your um, app re-engagement rates. Um, you have people who add um, service worker support so that your app can work offline. Um, it might just be as simple as storing some central components of your application in the, um, in the cache. It might also be a complete offline strategy. Um, when it comes to actual tools, um, I think it's the, the full range of uh, people having um, vanilla uh, JavaScript service workers to uh, people who use uh, third-party SDKs, like uh, they could have push notifications delivered from a vendor, so they just install the SDK and be good. Um, and then, of course, you have copy and paste style recipe service worker um, sites, like there's pwabuilder.com. They can just say, um, this is my site, um, you enter a URL, it spits out um, after like several checkboxes that you can check or uncheck, um, it spits out a ready-made service worker that you can then just put on your code. Um, or on your site. And um, then eventually we have um, libraries like, like Workbox.js that um, help abstract away a lot of the um, technical complexities of Service Worker um, programming and make like almost like a jQuery of Service Worker um, a lot of tasks a lot easier. So you've also been doing some work recently to build a new report on HTTP Archive for PWAs. What kinds of stats are you seeing there in relation to the adoption of progressive web apps? I think as soon as you want to do something at scale, so you want to look at not just one website that you can, of course, examine to the, um, yeah, to the deepest details, um, it's more like, how do you, on a technical angle, um, approach this? 
So um, in my study, I had essentially three approaches. Um, the first one was um, I looked at uh, a table in the HTTP archive um, that looks at Lighthouse data. So Lighthouse is a tool where you can um, yeah, run some audits for your website and then just get a score on different rates, um, like for example, uh, Progressive Web App, obviously, but then also performance, uh, SEO, um, accessibility, and so on. So I looked at the uh, Progressive Web App report part of this, and I'm then just looked at how the scoring in Lighthouse works. So um, there's essentially a PWA checklist where um, there's a set of machine testable things that Lighthouse as a tool can test. And um, then I looked at how many of these applications in the, or sites in the HTTP archive um, hit a certain minimum threshold or what, what score did they uh, get. And then I looked at the median uh, scores to then finally say something about like, how many of these websites could actually hit the bar of being uh, a progressive web app? The second approach that I took was um, I looked at something that in Chrome, the browser, uh, is called use counters. So um, use counters are special features that trigger when something in the uh, browser fires. And there's one uh, use counter that is called um, service worker control page. So essentially, whenever the page load of a page was controlled by a service worker, this use counter would fire. And we can see this in a table as well. So um, I essentially just looked at uh, the, the archive again um, and checked when and under what circumstances did this uh, thing fire. And um, you can then chart, of course, all the different um, findings that you see. The third approach was more like looking into the response bodies. And this is like the, the, the hardest one, actually, because there's just so much data. So you have uh, all the response bodies in the tables. and. Um, you sort of parse with regular expressions, which you should probably never do in production. <laughs> on HTML, uh, especially. Exactly. You parse uh, HTML and uh, try to figure out, um, did this website try to register a service worker? Um, then you can get the file name by parsing um, like between parentheses and the, the, the quotes and so on, the URL path. Then you try to see if you find this URL in the tables, and then you can use um, another query to then get the actual um, code contents of the service worker script to then see what kind of um, events does the service worker listen to. So um, right now published, we have the first two, so the use counters and the uh, Lighthouse one. Um, but yeah, maybe um, if, if this continues, we can also uh, try to see if there's a way to publish the third one as well. Mm -hmm. The charts have shown that the PWA score from Lighthouse, the median, is about 62%. And if I recall correctly, the service worker controlled page use counter is less than 1%, but the chart is actually showing a steep incline or a growth of service worker usage. Mm -hmm. Could you explain the 62%? Like, what does that number mean in relation to Lighthouse and PWAs on the web? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little bit um, what, what even makes a PWA. Um, if you ask this from people, you get different definitions. Um, with our uh, baseline PWA checklist, we try to just make a checklist of things that you must match to actually be called a PWA. And then for each of these, I think it's 14 points, um, out of which 11 are machine testable. Um, you get a score. And um, you then look at all these different scores until you hit a, a certain threshold. Where you can say this is um, an, a PWA that you can install to the home screen. Um, some of the things that uh, are machine testable is something as simple as does the site uh, serve over HTTPS, which is uh, one of the uh, core requirements of even being able to use the service worker APIs. Um, and then you also have more advanced uh, things like do all the URLs load um, in an offline experience. Um, and this is hard because like, what is even all the URLs that you can come up with in an application? Lighthouse tries its best to figure out like the core start URL, for example, in the manifest. Um, does it have a manifest in the first place? Is another test. And um, yeah, so you have these different checklist um, checks, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, then we try to figure out um, which, which uh, ones are checked to then see, um, can we make any statements about this is a PWA or not? Um, when you look at the use counters, you can see the curve is really going up, which is a good signal. Um, when you look at absolute numbers, it's really, really low still. So PWAs are in its infancy. Um, something to be noted is obviously um, this is, when you look at HTTP archive, this is um, the Alexa 1 million by now. Um, so there's 
a big corpus, but it's definitely not the entire web, but still uh, representative enough corpus. And in this corpus, we do see that there's um, like a hockey stick would be exaggerated, but uh, there's definitely strong uh, growth when it comes to PWA and uh, service workers. It is early days, but are you able to see any type of correlation with performance? Like are PWAs actually improving the performance of these sites? I think that there's two angles to this question. So performance is something that you can relatively easily measure by just uh, saying you define a metric like uh, first content for paint, for example. Um, that's something you can measure with the machine. Um, something that is out of our control is um, some of the core business metrics that a, that a vendor would, would care for, a company would care for. So when, when we try to make people build progressive web apps, um, one thing we can, of course, say is, look, if you do this and that, this will improve your first content full paint, whatever. Um, what the vendors always ask is, well, but does it have any impact on our conversion rate? Do we sell more? Do we, whatever, do we get more subscriptions by implementing this and that? So, and this is where it's a little bit more opaque. So, in a sense, this is a bit of the holy grail of the entire, do we go PWA or not? Um, we do have some case studies that we published. Um, the problem a bit with, with these case studies sometimes is, um, in many cases, they, they modified more than one variable. So they did not just purely add service workers or PWA features in general, but they might also have modified the site design or maybe the products changed. So there's just different things that um, play a role in this equation so that sometimes we can't really reliably say this is completely attributable to PWA. Um, sometimes it might just have been to a big part as well, a redesign, for example. Right. And it's not just as easy as implementing a PWA, it's also how you implement it. For example, it's one thing to have push notifications, but it's another thing when you overload the user with oh, yes. <laughs> notifications and requests to do things as soon as the page loads. Mm -hmm. So it's also a function of implementation as well, right? Right, um, so especially with push notifications, you can easily overdo it, and um, a lot of companies actually have. So um, when you ask for push notification permission right from the start, like right at the load event of the page, um, people don't have the context, like why should they even sign up for it? Um, whereas when you wait until something has happened, like for example, you have ordered something at a shop, um, the shop might ask, do you want to get a push notification once the item is ready for shipping? So that you actually have a context, like if I sign up, this is what I can expect. Um, the, the rate of happiness of people who sign up for these push notifications will be way higher. The downside a bit of like, why do people still aggressively from the start ask for push notifications is, um, it might have a positive impact in the short term because people just do anything to get the stupid dialogue away. So they might just click yes to make the dialogue go away. But then when the first notification comes in, they will just block it. Or in the worst case, they will even look for a setting in their browser that would um, block push notification prompts from the start. So um, if this happens, um, and Firefox have, have made this uh, blog post where they kind of highlighted this, fe this feature in the browser, um, that's of course a really bad thing to happen for the entire ecosystem because if some sites overdo it and people block uh, their, their browser from asking for push notification permission, um, they are yeah, completely out of the game for the entire feature. So yeah, I think definitely it comes down to when do you send push notifications, when do you ask for push notifications, the right frequency, um, should you push anything, it should always, in my opinion, be something where it's meaningful, timely, so that you actually get a real value out of signing up for push notifications. And speaking of push notifications and web APIs, the web APIs are constantly evolving. What kinds of things can developers expect with the future of PWAs? There's a lot of APIs right now that are not available everywhere. So when you look at the PWA set of features, um, we have service workers that are now available across the board, but within service workers, there's different um, like sub APIs that you can use. Um, for example, things like uh, navigation preload or background fetch or background sync um, that are not available everywhere. So for example, Safari, they implemented service workers per se, but um, in Safari, you can't use push notifications or you can't use background sync. So I think when it comes to the future, hopefully we can make more browser vendors uh, implement more of these APIs so that um, more and more people can really rely on these APIs being in all the browsers, no matter um, yeah, what, what uh, application they run. Could you briefly explain what background sync is? So background sync essentially allows you to, to fire and forget. So 
what it, what it can do is, for example, um, pile up your analytics requests um, that then would just fire at some point when the browser is back online. So in many cases, navigation can still happen while you're offline because sites might be cached. Um, vendors are always interested in tracking these events, like um, did people actually use my app while I was offline? So Background Sync allows you then to kind of replay all these different API requests. Um, it can also be used for like more from a user point of view, more user-friendly uh, features. Like for example, if you have a chat application, you can um, send um, a chat message even if you're offline and then just rely on the fact that whenever you go online again, the browser would send you a message no matter um, the network situation at the point of sending it. Um, so just like uh, if you have, I don't know, um, a native application like Facebook Messenger or uh, WhatsApp, you can compose messages offline and then just rely on the fact that at some point the browser would send them. So on the web with background sync, we do have this feature as well. So as the web capabilities get stronger and stronger, there seems to be more overlap with native applications like iOS and Android. How do you see this playing out with how users actually use applications, be it natively or on the web? So I think we have trained as, a, as an ecosystem um, at all. We have trained users to actually look at app stores first when it comes to applications. So if you want something, you have a brand that you engage with, but you do your grocery shopping, for example, you might look on an app store first nowadays so um, to, to, to download the app. So I think um, it's a little bit of how can we retrain users to go web first when they want to have something. In many cases, when, when nowadays you go on a website, the first thing the website asks you is, do you want to install the app? In most cases, it's no, I just want to use the website. That, that's why I came here. So um, I think it's, it's more, of a more a matter of uh, re-educating people to, to thinking web first. So when you think back, um, Steve Jobs, when, when, when he introduced the iPhone in 2007, um, in, the, in the keynote speech, the one last thing was actually web apps. So I think we, we need to go back there a little bit. Um, so 2008 was then when, when the App Store was introduced. So this is where, where it all started, where every, every butcher shop uh, needed their own native application. And um, we're realizing more and more, a lot of these applications are very expensive to maintain, very expensive to build in the first place. We have a very strong burden in getting people to download them. Um, just imagine your uh, car sharing um, app, for example. You arrive at an airport in a, in a different country, roaming is super expensive. Um, you just want a cab, and the first thing the cab application or web app asks you to do is download the native application. So you're like, no, I don't want to download 100 megabytes just to order a cab. You just want to use the web app and just be good. And uh, if the web app can do everything the native application can do, then uh, yeah, why, why have a native application in the first place? But that being said, this is not about killing native. There's a lot of very good use cases where you would still want native applications. Um, it's just more a matter of thinking, what is the right measure that you want to use right now for having um, a certain functionality? Because in the end, people don't really care about how something is implemented. They want a cab, they want to buy something, they want to get a hotel. So you have all these different use cases that are catered for by native applications or by web apps. Um, regular users who are not developers, they wouldn't really notice the difference if, it's, uh, if the web applications are well made. And users might be going to app stores and installing web apps directly, right? So we have seen, for example, Microsoft do this, um, where they put PWAs in the, uh, I think it's Windows Store or Microsoft Store, I never can remember. Um, so you can actually download, for example, the Twitter PWA on Windows um, as a desktop PWA and just install it. And it works super well and regular users don't even notice the difference just because it's really well made. So um, I think it's a matter of, yeah, how do you, how do you place all these different um, applications in front of the user? And um, in the case of the Windows App Store, it seems to work pretty well. So if you look at like all the benefits that you get from, star, uh, from, from uh, App Stores as well, you get star ratings, you get reviews, so you can see this is an, an application worthwhile installing. Do you have any closing words of wisdom for developers who might be building their first PWA? So when it comes to building the first public PWA, I think it's breaking down your own site into use cases. Like what, what use cases does my site even offer? If you are a newspaper, if you are a publisher, if you are, uh, I don't know, a hotel uh, comparison site or so, um, 
you need to think, what are my use cases? And then you go through the, the different PWA features that you have, and then you think step by step, where can PWA add value to my particular use case? When you're a publisher, maybe you can start with push notifications when breaking news events happen, so that people get steered back to the, to the application when breaking news um, happen. When you are a hotel site, you can think of, well, it's probably a pretty big application, so how can I make sure that it loads quickly? Um, how can I maybe even allow the app to work, in some cases, offline, so that you can have something like a hotel voucher, so that you can just show up at the place and say, look, this is my reservation. Um, even if you may be in a foreign country without roaming, so that in your app, you would still have your, uh, your booking details stored. So I think it's breaking down PWAs into features and not thinking of like this entire PWA thing as one opaque block, but breaking it down. And then just in general, shipping less JavaScript is, I guess, uh, good advice that generally <laughs> holds true. Well, Tom, thank you again for being here. If you'd like to learn more about PWAs, check out the links to the documentation in the description and share your PWA experiences in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.